All right, hi everyone. Welcome to our talk, uh, Collaborative Penetration Testing with Lair. I'm Tom Steele. I'm from Seattle. I'm currently a senior consultant at Fishnet Security. And uh, there's my Twitter if you want to follow me. Uh, and I'm Dan Coatman. I also work at Fishnet. Uh, I'm a consultant. Uh, we do pen tests and uh, social engineering engagement, sometimes physical security assessments as well. So uh, we were kind of we kind of built this tool layer to fix some problems that we were having um, on our engagements on our penetration tests, and those includes lots of files and, and lots of data everywhere, lots of terminal windows open, um, just tons of files everywhere, and uh, no real way to correlate those. The also the, the the other problem we wanted to uh, kind of fix was duplication of work. Um, a lot of times when you're doing a attack with multiple people, you know, two or more. You tend to sometimes look, be looking at the same thing, and uh, it's not very efficient. The next thing we wanted to do is come up with a way to be thorough and make sure that we didn't miss anything and that we were manually investigating everything on, a, on, a, on an engagement. So what we we kind of looked at the current tool sets, and we didn't really they didn't really focus they they all might have handled some of these issues, but they they really all the, and none of them fixed all of our problems. So what we did. Is we decided to create our own tool, and that's what we're going to be releasing today. It's called Layer, and it's just—it's uh, at its heart, it's a web application, so it's all in browser, and we think it solves all the problems that I previously mentioned. Here's an overview of the architecture. Um, in the top, the top right corner, you see this thing called Meteor Web Server. Um, so this web application is built with something called Meteor. That's a web framework built on top of Node.js, which is a JavaScript runtime. Uh, the, the features that we, the reason we chose Meteor, um, was a few reasons. The first being data on the wire. Um, it's very, very snappy, very, very fast. Originally, when you load up the application, all you get is a bunch of JavaScript and a bunch of HTML templates. Everything else after that is all JSON back and forth to and from the server. So it's very efficient, very, qu very quick. Uh, the next thing was Meteor is all written in JavaScript, so it's one language from the client to the server. Makes developing a, a lot better. Next is database everywhere. So with Meteor, you actually have a database uh, client in the browser. So when you're writing the application, it's very, very cool to be able to write your queries actually on the in the client, and uh, kind of makes things more efficient. You can de develop a real-time application very, very quickly. The next thing um, that's probably the best feature of Meteor is full-stack reactivity. Um, everything that you build in Meteor is real-time, meaning. Um, it doesn't do any sort of AJAX polling. It's all using WebSockets on the back end. And when you have that query in, in the browser, uh, when those queries kind of invalidate and the data changes, everything else will update as well. So it's built to be very, very real time. And that's kind of what we're looking for. Um, of course, the web application um, is only useful if we can get data into it via you know, all the automated tools that we use. And so Dan's going to talk about how that happens. Uh, yeah, so we. Uh the tools that actually consume the data we've, we call drones. Um, they're command line tools written in uh, Python that use a common API. Um, and they parse the data from uh, some of the tools that we commonly use for our, our pen tests. And that would be uh, we have drones for uh, Nessus, Nexbos, uh, Nmap, and Burp, as well as a raw JSON one. And we wrote them in Python for a couple of reasons. Um, we really thought that maybe we would get some better community support if we wrote them in Python rather than JavaScript because that can be a little bit uh, difficult, I think, to code in, um, especially if you don't have any experience uh, with it uh, before. Um, and we also decoupled it from uh, the application rather than building it directly into, uh, the, you know, the Meteor node application because we didn't want to force people to, to upload their files to the server just to import them. You know, you're sitting there watching your browser spin as it's importing. It's a little bit annoying. Um, and we also wanted uh, it decoupled so that, uh, you know, if you develop a tool to consume data, um, maybe it's uh, for, a, you know, something that you run in-house that maybe the community wouldn't want, um, it'd be a little bit easier to kind of integrate with, with um, the framework um, if it was decoupled. So the majority of this talk is actually going to be a demo. So we're going we're gonna to show, show off the app now. Alright. 
So I'm just going to create a project real quick. So when you first create a project, you're brought into this kind of uh, centralized host view. So um, if we had some data in here, it would be showing you a list of all the IP addresses, their host name, their operating system, and who last modified them by. Um, everything in Layer you can do manually. We do a lot of manual testing, and so we really need to be able to, you know, enter data randomly uh, from from many different data points. But um, of course, to kind of populate these initial things, you of course want to be using automated tools such as Nmap. Uh, it's a great tool. Um, so to do that, we're going to uh, you know import into the app. So to do that, you grab this unique identifier here and use the client side, Python uh, drone dash nmap. That's kind of the naming convention that we chose. But any, but if you you can name these things anything you, anything you want. So, and then I'm going to import this first nmap file. And uh, this is a vanilla scan of my network. So, um, no scripting engine, no version detection, no operating system detection. All right. So it actually parses it on the client, connects to the database, and inserts it. So as you can see, this automatically got repopulated. Uh, there was no screen refresh or anything like that. Let's take a look at this first uh, at this uh, dot one dot two address. And yeah, you can see that it's all it all got populated. This is the service level view. Um, so it kind of drills down into each service for each host. And take a look at this telnet service here. Um, and you can see that the product is set to unknown. That's because we didn't have any version detection on Nmap. So I did a second scan of just port 23 on this host with version detection. I'll try to switch back fast enough, and you can see that it automatically updated that pro the product of that host. Um, there was no there was no AJAX polling or anything like that. It was automatically just synced up with the client. So these drones are all additive, meaning if there's something that's missing, they will actually add to them, and that's kind of how all the, they, they all work. That's how the API works. The next thing I want to show off is the Nmap scripting engine is great, but what happens is when you run a ton of Nmap scripts, you end up with a bunch of different files, and you kind of have to look at them all manually in something like Vim or parse them out yourself. Uh, so what we did is we actually made the drones parse those. So this is this this next scan was a full scan of my network, both version detection, operating system detection, and script scanning enabled. See that we get the uh, FTP anonymous uh, MAP scripting output put in what we call a service level note here, and uh, you know this is just a service level view into each each port. You can move back and forth between them. You can mo update and modify all of these as well. Um, the next so the next thing so that kind of takes care of uh, importing our data, right? Um, let me import a Nexus a Nessus scan real quick. Okay, so once, it, once we, we just imported an SS scan and it again added more information such as host names identified and operating systems detected. Um, the next thing that we wanted to work on was uh, the collaboration effort and not duplicating work. So what we came up with was kind of this color based system. <laughs> oh my god, was that boring. All right, here we go. You guys know the drill. These are new speakers. All right, get what's up this, here. <laughs> I love that. We walk into rooms now. People have their hands up. It's awesome. What, what do we it, call this, Paul? Yeah. What do we call this? Shot the new. That's right. And we, what is your name? Nassim. Nassim. Na Nassim. We have Nassim. We have our speakers whose names I don't know. Tom. Tom. It's Tom. And Dan. And Dan. Do we have shots? We do have shots. I'm just trying to work. I'm sorry. Oh my God. All right. So we've, you know, done a couple of these already today. <laughs> this hour. I'm starting somebody, dancing. somebody uh, pull that bottle away from him. Did you guys drink before your talk? No. no. I'm sorry. Have you not been to DEF CON before? <laughs> <laughs> All right. 
Wait, wait, wait. Thank you. Welcome to DEF CON. And I'm sorry, DEF CON's been canceled. <laughs> That's the price you pay. Just remember this. Thank you. All right. Round of applause for Dan for taking the bullet for me. You told me not And now look what you've done. You've locked my computer. <laughs> okay, so now I have to move really fast. But uh, the, the idea here is that we didn't want to duplicate work. So what we came up with is a color coded based system. So first I need to add Dan to my project here. So now Dan has full view in the application. And we came up with this color coded based system. It has five different colors. So you see those at the top here. You see gray, blue, green, orange, and red. And those can mean whatever you want. They mean certain things for us. Uh, in particular, blue means that it's in progress. So I want to know what Dan's doing at all times. And I don't want to duplicate the things that he's doing. So all Dan needs to do is click a host. And as soon as he clicks it, it turns blue. And I can know that Dan's working on that. And then what might happen is they, we turn them green, there's no serious issues. Maybe if we turn them orange, that means we want to come back to it later. And if we turn it red, that may be a foothold in the network or it's pwned or there's, you know, sensitive data leaking out of that thing or something like that. Um, and so that's the kind of the color coded based system that we came up with so that we can track exactly what we're doing and not duplicate work. Um, what's really neat is all of these, these kind of filter. So if I click that blue button, it will filter out the blue ones. If I click the green one, it'll filter out the green ones. And so we can really focus on, you know, see what hasn't been done and what has been done. And this works at every every level, uh, the port, the service level, the vulnerability level as well. Um, we imported that Nessus scan, and you can see that uh, a list of vulnerabilities got imported in here. You can you can make these, create these manually, etc. And like I said, they all have statuses as well. The typical things that you'd expect from an application like this: description, evidence, solution, a list of hosts. These are all linkable. Everything like that, and uh, you know any notes that might be available as well. <clears throat> the next thing that we kind of want to show, I can put the project uh, the update, the client side update. The, since uh, you know, which is kind of like the best thing about Meteor is that it allows client side updates. Uh, for security purposes, we have those turned off, uh, meaning that anytime you do a database query, it gets you get shipped down to the server. But what's very useful is we do allow you to turn that functionality on so that you can do anything on the client. And what that lets you do is kind of create some very interesting JavaScript scripts that you can run in your browser. So I have to allow these and you're giving the security warnings telling you that you're, al you're allowing them here. I come back to my project, load it up. Dan has uh, graciously provided me with this script. So what this script does, it's kind of lengthy but um, it just goes through each host, looks to see if any of those hosts have any available services, and if they don't, it's going to turn them green because there's nothing to test. And when you're testing thousands of hosts, it can kind of be efficient. So the idea is that you can write one off JavaScript scripts to kind of transform your data in various ways. So if you just open up the JavaScript browser, or console, I'm sorry, and you uh, paste this in, get so you can see. So I know dot six and four six don't have any services. So these queries are being run on the on the client and they're being shipped down the server and the data has been updated. Um, another cool thing that's just built in is chat. So. So if you're on an internal engagement or something and you don't want to feel like getting around a firewall, you can, uh, you can just use the inbuilt chat like that. Um, yeah, and that's kind of it. There's other things um, <coughs> such as, uh, okay, uh, next thing is this service tab. Uh, a very common thing when you're on a penetration test is you want to get lists of hosts that have certain services open. So you can do that here and search through these um, or you can also just click. So this is a unique list of uh, port, protocol, service, and product. If you click on any of these, it will reduce the search and give you just a list of the hosts with that port open, um, which is very, very cool. It's, it's, it's just kind of a convenience thing. 
Another thing you, you might want to track during, during a test is uh, credentials. So those happen at the service view. So you can add those in here or you can might maybe build a drone that adds these in. So they're, they're shown here. Um, they're shown at the, at the top service level view here and then they're also given to you in, in, in a, kind of a, its own tab here as credentials. So that's it. Uh, let me uh, bring up the slides again here. So the next step that we have in the project is that we need more parsers. Like I said, we only have them for four tools, so we'd like to write more. So if you have any tools in particular, like Qualys, I know is a huge one. Um, we're gonna, we're, we'd like, we will write those, or we'd also like the community to contribute writing them as well. Um, one of the biggest things that we're looking at doing is syncing with Metas this Metasploit database so that you can basically use both applications and have the data synced simultaneously. Um, so we are working on that. And another big thing is we know we need more documentation. If you go to the, when you see the GitHub site, you'll see that the documentation is pretty sparse. Um, we have been spending the past six months on this trying to make it very, very polished and make sure everything works. So the code and getting it working has been our, our major goal here. Um, the documentation is next. So um, we'll have documentation up of how you can interact with the API to build your own parsers, um, how you can install it from scratch, et cetera. The, the source code is all available on GitHub. That's the link there. Right now, um, we do provide you with pre-compiled packages. So it has a database, um, a specific version of Node, the application, all bundled up in kind of with some easy to do, easy to use shell scripts. Those are about 100 meg each, and they're for each. They're for Linux, 32-bit, 64-bit, and OS X. I didn't have. I didn't have the uh, bandwidth to upload them here at DEF CON, so they will be uploaded tomorrow as soon as I get home. Um, but you can just follow that, uh, that GitHub uh, address and, you know, track it there. Also, if you want to hit me up on Twitter, I can send you the link and that's my IRC name on Freenode and that's Dan's Twitter. Um, so I, we have some extra time. Are there any questions? Yes? Yeah, so the way Meteor works is, like I said, it has a database driver kind of written on the client. We deny all of those so that the queries actually get shipped down to the server. You can kind of do it either way. So that security warning is just basically saying, hey, you're going to allow all of your users to modify the database without any sort of validation. So um, on the server, we actually do pretty strict validation on what in data you're putting in. So it will validate that you're putting an actual IP address in. That doesn't do anything of that. So you kind of have to trust what you're doing. Um, and that's only available, those settings are only available to administrative users. Any other questions? Okay, well, thanks for coming out.